Hello again. Welcome back to the second part of 5.3, Physics in the Quantum Mechanical Model. This image shows the change in the atomic model as we went from Dalton's original concept of atoms as hard spheres, clear up through our current model, the electron cloud model, based upon Schrodinger's equation. As you may recall, Bohr wanted to explain the line spectra of elements and he believed that the light emitted by excited electrons was due to movement of electrons from higher to lower energy levels. But how do you excite electrons? Passing an electric current through a tube containing an element in its gaseous state does cause the electrons to become excited. As a matter of fact, as they lose the energy from their excited state, then that energy gets emitted as light. This is how neon lights work, as we can see in this cardinal sign. Neon lights actually got their name from the fact that the original lights were filled with neon gas. But this only produces red glowing lights if you use just neon. Other colors come from exciting other gases, such as helium, shown with a pinkish lavender hue here, and argon, which produces a blue color. But why do their colors differ? What makes them produce different colors? This takes us back to what we've been studying in sections one and two of this chapter. Remember that each element has its own unique electron configuration. As each type of atom absorbs energy, its electrons can move to higher energy levels. However, when they fall back to a lower energy level, the energy that they lose gets given off as light energy. The color given off as an electron falls back corresponds to a particular amount of energy that is given off. Now as we relate energy with the frequency of light given off, we have to look at a man by the name of Max Planck because he discovered that there is a direct relationship between the energy given off and the frequency of the light. It can be written as the equation E equals H nu, where E is energy, H is Planck's constant and has a value of 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th joule seconds. And nu, of course, represents the frequency. So what does this equation actually mean? What does it tell us? It tells us that each transition within an excited atom produces a line of a specific frequency in the spectrum. So electrons jump out to higher energy levels and as they fall back, their amount of their fallback corresponds to a particular frequency in the spectrum. The set of all these lines for an element is known as its atomic emission spectrum, and it's just as unique as a fingerprint. As we look at these emission spectra, we can see that each one is definitely different from the others. Now they may share some lines in common, but the entire set of lines is unique for each one. You know, sometimes discoveries in one area of science, such as chemistry, become important in solving problems in another area of science, such as astronomy. Such was the case about 150 years ago. In 1868, Pierre Janssen and Joseph Norman Lockyer discovered an emission spectrum from gases on the surface of the sun that did not match any known elements on Earth at that time. However, in 1895, William Ramsey discovered the existence of helium on Earth, and the emission spectrum of helium was found to be identical to that of the unknown gas observed by Janssen and Lockyer almost 30 years previously. When you combine these two discoveries, it tells us that Earth and the stars do have some elements in common. Now, why is this important anyway? Well, emission spectra can be used to identify the composition of distant stars as well as that of our own sun. So that's why it's important. We can't go to distant stars yet or even our own sun. And even if we went there, collecting a sample is pretty difficult. But we can tell the composition without having to have a sample by looking at emission spectra that are produced as the light from the sun passes through a prism. Now you can read about Bohr's discoveries with hydrogen on pages 142 to 143 and do the extra credit worksheet 5.3 if you choose. You have the knowledge now to be able to do that worksheet. And I encourage you to try that because it's an excellent way of getting used to using the equation that was just introduced with Planck's constant. And it also is a great opportunity for some extra credit points. Maybe a little tedious, but at the same time it gets you lots of points. One important term from Bohr's work is the ground state. This is the state in which an electron has the lowest possible energy. 
For hydrogen, it means its electron has a principal quantum number of one. Remember that light was accepted to have properties of both particles and waves. The acceptance of the dual wave particle behavior of light was in part due to Einstein's proposal that light could be described as quanta of energy that behave as if they are particles. Light quanta, which are particles of light, are known as photons. Louis de Broglie, as a graduate student, took this one step further. He wondered if particles could also behave like waves. He called the wave-like behavior of particles matter waves. His theory was supported only three years later by experiments which showed electrons behaving like waves when they were reflected from metal surfaces. Remember, electrons are tiny particles of matter, and therefore matter can behave in a wave-like fashion as well. An application of matter waves is the electron microscope. Electron microscopes use the wave-like nature of electrons to produce clear images of objects that would be too small to get a good image using visible light reflection, such as what we see here on the right. These are not computer-generated images, so to speak, although computers are used to interpret the information as electrons are being bounced back to a detector. On the upper right, what we see is a flower mite an insect known as a mite that is sitting in a pile of flour and it's very tiny and something you may be more familiar with hopefully not too familiar is the louse human lice that picture on the bottom right is an electron micrograph of a louse that's attached to a human hair that's what they really look like up close so if all particles behave like waves why is it we can't see the effects of this wave-like behavior? And it turns out that for the wavelength produced to be observed, the mass of the object has to be very small. Large objects would produce a wave with too small of a wavelength to be seen. For example, a 50-gram golf ball traveling 90 miles per hour has a wavelength of only 3 times 10 to the negative 34 meters. Now, how small is that? That's point and then 33 zeros followed by a three. To give you an idea of its size, the diameter of an electron, which we know to be extremely small, the diameter of an electron is only six times 10 to the negative 15th meters. And this is much, much, much smaller than that. When you look at the exponent, 10 to the negative 34 of a meter, that's an extremely small amount and is not detectable. Werner Heisenberg discovered another important fact when dealing with very small objects such as subatomic particles. It is impossible to know exactly both the velocity and the position of a particle at the same time. And the reason that this is, is that to locate an object, you can strike it with something. Visually locating an object requires striking it with photons, photons of visible light that is. Striking an electron with photons will cause the electron to move from its original location in some unpredictable way. So then it's no longer located there. And I believe I described this to you earlier this chapter. Here's a diagram that helps to explain it. We have an incoming photon of light on the left striking an electron that was currently moving to the right. Notice after it has been struck, the electron is no longer moving to the right, but is kind of moving down and to the right. And the photon is also changed in direction. So when they strike, they change each other's movement as well as their location. This is known as the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. The discovery of matter waves allowed Schrodinger to describe the quantum mechanical nature of electrons and atoms. This led to the concept of electron orbitals and electron configurations, which included the wave-like motion of matter as well as the uncertainty principle. And that ends our presentation for section three, which means we are now done with chapter five and you need to begin to prepare for our test.